Amen. Thank you guys so much. Well, if you weren't here with us last week, last week we looked at a discipleship pathway. It's on your bullets. And again, this week, the overview and on the back page is the detail. Just run back through that with you quickly before the message this morning. Discipleship pathway to help you know if you're on track the way the Lord has led us here at Sandia Baptist Church to go about making new disciples and discipling ourselves, You'll notice that it is a circle or an oval. I went to public school in Texas. You've got to give me a break. But the idea is that it is a cycle, that the whole reason that we're still here as believers is so that we might lead others to Christ and so that they might lead others to Christ, and so that they might lead others to Christ. You're here in the crowd today. The crowd is where it begins for many people. The crowd is the corporate body. The crowd is important. It's where we meet together as a family. It's our family dinner table, if you will. You really enter the crowd when you've come to know Christ as your Savior, followed Him in believer's baptism. You've become a member of the church for this time in your life here with us, and you begin to be an active part in every way. But we encourage you not to stay there where you could be just a face in the crowd, but that you go on to community. 9 a.m., we have what we call connection groups, connection classes. It's a place where you can interact over the Bible. You can get to know people a little bit better. Those don't have to happen at 9 a.m. on Sunday. Most of them do, but there's flexibility there. They could meet anywhere at any time. But then we encourage you, and in April we'll be emphasizing that community section. In May, although some have already gotten started and are already working on the circle part of the Oval, in May we'll be launching and encouraging and explaining to you a very simple way that you could meet once a week, anywhere, anytime, coffee shop, restaurant, home, with a very small group a group that you could really get to know, that you could give permission to get into your life and to encourage you and to pray for you and to hold you accountable. But it doesn't stop there, and these don't have to be any particular order necessarily. In June, we'll be giving great emphasis to our personal time uh, on the couch, our quiet time, we call it, our daily devotional as individuals, and also if you have family living with you, we're going to once again just encourage you and make it very, very easy and clear how you as a family, as a couple, could read the Word and pray together. And then you don't have to wait for this last one, but crew, it's an Albuquerque word for serving. We all want to be serving through sharing Christ with other people. We're going to be giving you some training that I'm excited about later this summer, but you don't have to wait for that either. It's being involved in our missions endeavors here locally and around the world through going through giving, through praying, and then it's finding that place for you to serve here at Sandia Baptist Church. You'll be hearing more and more about these things, not canceling anything. You can do as much as you want, but in a way that you've probably, in fact, someone wrote me last Sunday and said, I've never heard in all my years as a believer the pastor say, you don't have to do everything. You can, and we're not going to cancel it, but we're saying, do this. And give yourself time to minister, to reach others, to be with your family, and trying to give you a concrete way to be a part. Well, we'll be talking more and more about that. But let's go to the Lord in prayer together this morning. Lord, thank you for these songs we've had the privilege of singing about you and to you this morning. And oh, how true it is in my life that all my life you have been so faithful. Lord, I just declare that there's never been one time that I've acted on your word that I was disappointed later. But oh, how many times I have not acted on your word and been disappointed. But through every one of those moments, good and bad, you have been faithful. You have been unchanging. You have been so, so good to me. And Lord, I pray today for many things. We pray for the coronavirus here and around the world. Lord, our biggest prayer is not for us. 
Lord, if I catch the coronavirus and die, I'm coming to heaven. But my prayer is that you'd use it in others' lives, that you'd use this fear, uh, realistic or not realistic, you'd use it to draw people to Christ. You'd use it to cause people to think about eternity. I pray for our medical personnel, even here in this room, that you'd be with them as they prepare to deal with whatever comes our way. But Lord, I just pray that you would use this for your kingdom, for your glory. We do pray for those who have this and all other sicknesses and viruses that you'd have mercy on them and bring healing. Lord, we pray today for a sister church, for Albuquerque Chinese Baptist Church. Oh, Father, use them today. Equip them, prepare them. Use them to reach Chinese language, Chinese background individuals in Albuquerque, but also use them to reach others outside that group. And Lord, now as we turn to your word, I just pray that you would speak to me, that you'd speak through your word, you'd speak to each one of us, and you'd do more than we could ever ask or imagine or think today. Oh, Holy Spirit of God, we pray that you would fall on this place. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Matthew. As we are in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, we begin today a series on the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. <clears throat> slide right. Slide right for frown, slide left, for smile. If you read the Wall Street Journal this week, it was timely, looking at this sermon on the Beatitudes, more and more companies are wanting to keep up with the happiness factor in their employees. Some parts of the company, Blue, Cl Blue, Blue Cross Blue Shield, employees can track and employers can anonymously track their employees' patterns of happiness. Every day, sliding the scale back and forth. Am I smiling today? Am I frowning? Or am I somewhere in between? Many, many companies doing this. Then even yesterday, uh, I saw on the newsstand by the clerk there, a news magazine front cover, The Science of Happiness. Everybody wants happiness. The only problem is most folks don't have any idea where to go to get happiness. And so Jesus, here in the Sermon on the Mount, turns everything upside down in giving us the secret, hidden pathway to happiness. And so we read about it here in Matthew 5. We, when we were in Matthew 4, we, began, we saw that at the end, the great multitudes were following him. And so we pick up here. When he saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. His disciples and all of this crowd. And so Jesus, likely, we don't know exactly where this was, but Jesus is likely at the bottom of the hill looking up the hill where the multitudes are sitting, and he's going to preach for these next three chapters the best and most famous sermon ever. In verse 2, and opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle or the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. I skipped one. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for my sake, the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men cast insults and persecute you and say all kinds of evil falsely against you on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Well, there's a lot here, and we could spend a long time on each one of these, but I want us to look at these together today. Matthew is writing to those believers with a Jewish background, 
And Matthew, it seems from the Holy Spirit, is gifted and taxed so often at taking Old Testament truth and applying it for New Testament believers, particularly those who would have known that Old Testament truth. And it's as if Matthew is giving a New Testament version of the Ten Commandments. It's a Christian job description. It's a Christian character list. We're looking, we're looking at a discipleship pathway which involves some action, but Matthew here is looking at a heart change that produces character in the believer. In some ways, they're progressive. They mount upon each other, not necessarily, but there's certainly a, a truth there. But let's just look at these one at a time. Blessed, he says, and uh, you probably know this word blessed there means, oh, how happy. Thus, the title of the message, Jesus is saying, oh, how happy. Now, the world's happiness is usually empty for the very reason that, that the world's version of happiness is inward focused. It's self-focused. And so, when my happiness is self-focused, it usually leaves me unsatisfied. But Jesus is presenting here a happiness, really, we would think of it more like a lasting joy that comes from being God-focused and others-focused. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? How, how happy is the one who is poor in spirit. This is how we come to Christ. You can't come to Christ to have your sin forgiven and enter into that discussion with God and say, hey, here I am. I'm ready to negotiate with you. Here's what I bring to the table. What do you got? No. The way to come to Christ for salvation is just this, to be poor in spirit, to realize that I have nothing to bring to the table, that in fact I have less than nothing to bring to the table because I am condemned and sentenced to hell because I am a sinner. But to be poor in spirit says, I have nothing, and therefore, oh, God in heaven, if you love me so much that you would die on the cross for me, saving a sinner who knew better and still sinned and still sins against you, I'm, please forgive me. Please let me receive what you have done for me on the cross, for Jesus to leave the glories of heaven, knowing before the beginning of time who I was, what I would do against you, and still choosing even before the beginning of time to leave heaven's glory, to come to this earth, to live and to die on my cross and to be ro risen again to, and to go back to heaven and to pay for my sin. I have nothing to bring. Please, please forgive me. Poor in spirit realizing that everything that I have has come from the Lord. Everything that I have spiritually, every blessing that I have is from the Lord. The psalmist writes it this way in Psalm 51. David says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, my sins. My sin is ever before me and against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you're, ju you're justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. That's the attitude that we need to come to Christ, and it's the attitude that we need throughout our life to always realize that everything that I have spiritually is from the Lord. I didn't do it. I didn't gain it on my own, and I don't keep it on my own, but He has done it. Some of you today, that's where you need to start. You have not been poor in spirit but you've been rich in spirit. You've been proud in spirit. And you've said, I don't think I really need God. I'm a pretty good person. Pretty good people go to hell. That's not God's will. So much so that he left heaven to die for me and to die for you on the cross. But we don't stay there. The idea is not that as a believer, we're always puny. We're always, I'm no good. I can't do anything. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, no, I'm just stuck here at the beginning. Mm -mm. No, that's where we start. But if the Spirit of Christ is in us and living in us and we're yielding to Him, now we're to grow. We're to keep on going down the path. He goes on, he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Well, what are we mourning about? I'd say primarily the idea here is that we're mourning about our sin. I've come to Christ Poor in spirit, where everyone can be rich, 
And the Spirit of God comes to live inside of you. The Spirit of God came to live inside of me. And then I have an, a, an ongoing comparison as I read the Word of God every day and I realize how far short I fall. And as I look at the plumb line, as I look at the mirror of God's Word and realize I have a long way to go. And we begin to mourn and care for our sin. Care certainly for the sin in the church, the sin in the world, but not in a self-righteous way, not in a focused way where I care more about your sin than I do about my sin. No, I need to care more about my sin than I do yours. Certainly, uh, as believers, we need to grieve for the sin that is in the world that is hurting the Father's heart, but no, it's, it's me. I'm a part of it. God sent Amos into the northern kingdom, and one of his primary responsibilities was to live in the northern kingdom and to pray, God, forgive us of our sin. You see throughout the Old Testament especially, the prophets who were certainly imperfect but were in touch with God, and what did they pray? God, forgive these wicked people. No, they prayed, God, forgive us for our sin. And oh, how we need believers to be crying out to God for our sin, considering ourselves, as Paul did, to be the chief of sinners. Jeremiah, God spoke to him for Israel, and he said, Israel, you've forgotten how to blush. And I'm afraid more and more in the church, in America, we've forgotten how to blush. Sin doesn't really bother us. We're forgiven, the cross is paid for our sin, and nothing really matters. Again, I'm not encouraging you to be self-righteous because that doesn't do anything either. But I'm encouraging me, I'm encouraging you to ask God to help us to blush, to help us to not be so comfortable that we don't even see sin anymore. It doesn't seem that big of a deal to us anymore. That We'd see it as a big deal because of what it does to God's heart and because of what it does to God's kingdom and that we would want to heed the words throughout the New Testament to flee to see how far we can get from sin. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. He says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Uh, Gentle, meekness. This made about as much sense in the day that Jesus said it as it does in our day. Nobody wants to be meek. Nobody wants to be gentle. We want to be strong and be empowered. Well, we misunderstand this word. It doesn't mean weak. It doesn't mean puny. It's like a stallion that's been broken. Strength under control. It's what Jesus was. And I love this story, and you'll hear me from time to time refer back to it when they came to look for Jesus in the Garden of Eden. And here was Jesus. He was God. He had created the ends of the earth. He had spoke the earth and the heavens into existence. And he had put, willingly, he had put limits on himself to live on this earth so that he made himself need to sleep and need to eat. He was 100% God, but 100% man. And they came to look for him in the garden of Gethsemane. Did I say Eden? They came to look for him in the garden of Gethsemane. Just see if you're listening. (laughs) And he said, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And just for a moment, he pulled the lid up just a little bit. And he said, I am he. Boom! It knocked him back to the ground. He was meek. He was strength that we'll never know. Under control. Choosing to allow the Lord to cause us, to grow in us a meekness that says, you're more important than I am. Your needs and others' needs are more important than I am. The Lord is more important than I am. And to daily grow in giving our rights and our reputations to the Lord To the degree that I do so, to the degree that I turn over my rights, my reputation to the Lord, you really can't hurt me anymore because I'm meek. I want to grow in being meek so that I have the Lord's strength in me, controlling me. In the Old Testament, Proverbs says, he who has control over his spirit is greater than he who takes a city. Real men are letting the Lord cause them to be meek. Real women are letting the Lord cause them to be meek. But if you overlook and overlook, but then you explode pretty regularly, that's really not meekness on the heart 
level. Letting God cause us to be meek. But he goes on. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Do you have a hunger and thirst for righteousness? None of us are sinless. But is it a goal of yours? Or is righteousness the thought of it a burden in your life? We need to fix our wanters. We need to train our hungers and our thirst. God gave us good thirsts, good hungers. Even those must be trained. He says to have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness gives satisfaction. And that's the only way to have satisfaction. And there are wrong hungers, and there are wrong thirsts. The world, and unfortunately even the church, not this church, are beginning to tell us that some hungers are okay. God gave us a hunger for the opposite sex. Now that must be used the way that he ordained. But any hunger outside of that We're all sinners, but that hunger is not okay. We're not self-righteous, but it's just important that we continue to teach ourselves that that hunger doesn't come from the Lord, like any other hungers that don't come from the Lord, like the hungers that I have that don't come from the Lord. But we just need to understand what the Lord says. We need to ask God to help us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. It comes from being in His Word. It comes from being in prayer. It comes from memorizing His Word. It comes from accountability in our lives. God, train us to seek after righteousness in our life. He says, if you do, you will be satisfied. Romans 13, 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. I was excited to move here two years ago to be with you. One of the things that I wasn't excited about was your mascot, the rattlesnake. I don't like snakes except on boots and belts. So I don't want to make any provision for them to be in my house, in my yard. We had a snake. We weren't sure what it was last year. And I see people in our neighborhood. You you, you tear up an arroyo and put a neighborhood there. You're going to have some snakes. And say, well, call this guy. He can relocate it. Well, we relocated ours. Um, Anyway, I'm just saying. That's what, you know. No provision for snakes, and God says no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. He goes on, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Oh, how it builds to be people who have the mercy of God towards others, to to look at others with cross-shaped glasses so that when I see you and see what you might have done to me knowing or unknowingly, when you see me and, and know what I have done knowingly or unknowingly, that we'd see each other through cross-shaped glasses. Oh, I've done so much more to the Lord, and He forgave me on the cross. Merciful. Ephesians 4.32, Paul writes, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ also has forgiven you. And that wonderful parable over in Matthew 18, the one who owed much, and he begged the one to whom he owed it for forgiveness of the debt, and he forgave the debt, and he immediately goes and finds the one who owed him very little, and he says, I won't forgive your debt. You'll be cast into debtor's prison. But then the one who had forgiven much found out, and he says, no, no, you're the one going to the debtor's prison, and you will remain there until you pay the debt. And one asked a good question, how do you pay a debt from debtor's prison? Well, I think the answer for us spiritually is you forgive. And when you forgive, you let yourself out of prison. Merciful towards others as God has been merciful to us. And then he says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Can you imagine? Wouldn't it be wonderful for God to say to you, you, you're a sinner, but you're pure in heart. What a goal. He says, if you're pure in heart, you see God. Psalm 37, one of my favorite verses here says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Because the more I think like the Lord, the more I can have anything I want. Because I want the things of the Lord. 
And the more that I work on these and allow the Lord to work in me to build these attributes into my life so that someday the Lord could really say to me, your motives are pure. Your, your words, your actions, your intentions, you're, you're working out of a pure heart. I want that. He says, then you'll see me. You'll be thinking so much like me that you'll see me. Now, all of these promises are the already and the not yet. As believers, we're getting all of these blessings to some degree, and some of them will get more fully in the end. To be pure in heart. Proverbs 4 23 says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. It's from the inside that it all flows. And like a goalie works hard to keep that ball out of the net and out of that goal, God says to us, you need to be doing what you can do, what you know you can do, to keep the world's ways and thoughts and all of the things that your flesh wants to let into your heart out to keep your heart pure. Now, now the, the, the purity of heart ultimately, obviously, comes from the cross. We're not pure in ourselves, but we can act on what He's done for us on the cross, and we can experience this in a growing degree. Then He says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Jesus was the ultimate peacemaker, and so when we are peacemakers, we are like Christ. Romans 12, Paul says, as much as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. You can't make others be at peace with you, but you can still be at peace with them no matter what they do to you. When you're making peace between you and someone else, When you're making peace between two brothers and sisters in Christ, you're pleasing God. You're strengthening His kingdom. You're strengthening His church. I can tell you as a church leader, it grieves church leaders when you see brothers and sisters at odds with each other, and it blesses and rejuvenates when you see brothers and sisters getting right with one another. Let the reconciliation be as public as the offense. There may be someone here today, you know you're at odds with them, they know that you're at odds, and you may need to go and just say, hey, you know, I haven't been right. Will you forgive me? Now, in your heart, you know they've been a little bit wrong too, but you don't talk about that. That doesn't go anywhere. You let God deal with that. If you've hated someone in your heart for 20 years, please don't go to them and say, I've hated you in my heart for 20 years. That doesn't do anything. You go to God, and you ask God, God, what I've done to you is so much more. Help me forgive. And every time I remember what they've done, help me forgive again and again and again. We don't forgive and forget. We're very good rememberers, and the devil wants us to remember, and he helps us all day long. It's every time you remember it, God, you've forgiven me of so much more. Let me forgive. But then these last few verses talk to us about What's likely going to happen if you try to live out and let the Lord live through you, these beatitudes? Blessed are those, verse 10, who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And here's the key. I've known, you've known too many believers who are claiming to be persecuted for Christ when they're actually being persecuted because of their attitudes and their words. Uh, They snap at the clerk and can't believe the clerk isn't very nice to them, and they're suddenly persecuted for Christ. They constantly belittle their children or their spouse, and they can't believe that things aren't going well there, and so they're persecuted for their faith. They complain about everybody to everybody else, and they can't believe no one wants to be around them, and so they're suddenly persecuted for Christ. That's not what he's talking about. No, he says, persecuted for the sake of righteousness. You've said, like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, And others, you've said, you know what? I'm going to politely stand for the Lord in this area of my life, in these attitudes and others. I'm going to politely seek after righteousness and mercy and meekness and poorness of spirit and on and on. And some people aren't going to like that. 
Some people aren't going to like it just because of the very fact that when you try to follow the Lord in these ways, it's going to remind them that they're not, and they're going to react against you. What do you do? You just start reapplying these beatitudes to those people. He says, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Blessed are you when men cast insults at you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me, and they will. And folks, when people say things that aren't right about you, and sometimes they say things that are partly right about you but with the wrong motive and a wrong method, ask God, where's the truth in this, God? So many times when someone does you wrong, there is a truth in there. That doesn't make them right, but there's always something to learn from what they say. But when they do these things, he says, rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were for you. You might be here today and you say, there's really nothing to persecute me for because I'm not really living for Christ. Hardly anyone ever even knows that I even go to church, much less live for Christ. And so you may need here in just a moment to come and pray, God, help me to be poor in spirit. Help me to be mournful for my sin. Help me to be meek. Help me to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Help me to be merciful. Help me to be pure in heart. Help me to be a peacemaker. Some of you are already on that path, and you say, I I am being persecuted. And you'd say, I want to choose. Lord, help me to rejoice, to count it all joy, to, to be thankful that I get to be in the company of Christ and the prophets. He says, they were persecuted before you. This is nothing new. As American Christians, we don't like that. We don't like the promise in the New Testament that says all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. That's not my like, life verse. I don't like that. But it's true. And so God, help me to rejoice. Over in Acts chapter 5, one of the times that they were persecuted, they were released. And it says in Acts 5, 41, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer. I don't know if you can say that in proper English in America today, to rejoice that you've been counted worthy to suffer. That's not usually our natural reaction. Amen. Our natural reaction is to call our senator, to get on the prayer line. Someone cut in front of me in traffic because I'm a Christian. I just know it. I'm persecuted. And I'm making fun of me too. But oh God, that I could be worthy of suffering for you. What a, what a blessing God says that is. Some of you today, you need to start with the poor in spirit and come and receive Christ as your Savior. You're in this room. You believe in God. He's tugging at your heart because you don't know for sure that you know him. You don't know for sure that if you died today, you'd spend eternity with Christ in heaven. And you need to come and take one of us by the hand and just say, help me. Help me know for sure. I want to believe in Christ as my Savior. Others of you today need to come and just pray. I mean, when I read the Beatitudes, I don't know about you. I hope it's not just me. I fall short. And some of you just need to be humble enough today to just come and just pray at the altar. God, help me. Help me let you build these attributes in my life. Some of you need to come and say, this is to be my church home at this time in my life. Some of you need to come and say, I know Christ is my Savior, but I've never gone public. I need to follow him in believer's baptism. God's at work in my heart right now. I hope he's in work in your heart. I trust he is. I know he is. And I'm praying that you'll act on it, that you won't just sing, listen, check it off, and go home, but you'll do something. You'll step out today in your heart, or to come to talk, or to come to pray, as we pray and then we sing. Father, thank you so much for your challenge to me this week as I've been chewing on this and you've been using it in my heart, in my life. Oh, Father, help me to grow in these characteristics, in these attributes. As the Spirit indwells me, as the Spirit moves in me, help me to yield to you. Lord, let us be a church who desires to be these kind of people, who takes these things seriously, who wants to be different, not just different by attending church, but different by growing in Christ, by living out these things so that you can really make us to be a useful people for your kingdom. 
God, there are those today, they know they need to come to know you as Savior. Oh, Father, Spirit of the living God, today, let them come and say, I want Jesus. And Lord, there are a whole host of other ways that you're moving and working today. Help us to be people who respond today. For I pray it in Jesus' name, amen. We stand together. You come, you pray, you talk.